Hello, and welcome to our webinar, a transatlantic celebration of the Times crossword. My name is Desiree Shah, and I'm the program and marketing assistant here at Times Journeys. During this webinar, learn about our transatlantic cruise celebrating the 75th anniversary of the New York Times crossword, where you'll join the Times crossword team on a sailing aboard the luxurious Queen Mary II. With daily game sessions, private lectures, and exclusive access to the Times experts, you'll solve your way across the Atlantic. We're here today with Deb Amlin, editor of the Times Wordplay column, Joel Fagliano, Times Digital Puzzle Editor, and Ben Zimmer, a linguist and lexicographer and the language columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Before we begin, why travel with the New York Times? First of all, each of our small group tours and cruises travels with a Times journalist or subject matter expert. In addition to formal talks and Q&A sessions, your experts are there to lend their unique perspective to your trip. Their informative lectures are specifically designed to educate and inspire you and to bring to life the remarkable civilizations and cultures of the regions you visit. We offer small group tours and cruises, and you can choose from over 50 itineraries. And we visit destinations that tell a story, destinations as diverse as Kashmir, Cuba, or Provence, and explore everything from their history to culture and politics. Lastly, when you take a time's journeys, you can escape the crowds with tours that include after hours entrance to museums and access to attractions normally closed to the public. You'll arrive into New York on the first day of your trip and stay overnight at the Westin New York at Times Square. The next day, your journey begins with an exclusive event at the New York Times building, where you'll attend brunch with your fellow Times Journeys travelers and your Times experts. This event is hosted by Will Shorts, editor of the Times Crossword Puzzles. For nearly 25 years, Will Shorts has edited the daily crossword puzzles for the Times, creating many himself. He is also the director of the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament and the founder of the World Puzzle Championship. The author of over 500 books, he is also the subject of the featured documentary film, Wordplay. You'll hear from him and learn about the history of the Times Crossword, and you'll meet your onboard experts who will accompany you on the cruise. After the brunch, you'll transfer as a group to the Queen Mary II to begin your cruise. Once on board, you'll be immersed in the wor world of puzzles. Your home for the next seven days will be Cunard's Queen Mary II. The ship was first entered service in 2004 and was refitted in 2016, transforming the interior and exterior with luxurious and modern updates. On board, you'll have access to numerous facilities. Relax in the bars and lounges around the ship or dine in their two specialty restaurants. Browse through the shops and art galleries on board. Unwind in the Canyon Ranch Spa, offering a variety of spa treatments. And the ship offers modern gym facilities, as well as a range of fitness classes, sports courts, and swimming pools. The Queen Mary II also has the largest library at sea and the only ballroom at sea. Each of your staterooms comes with an array of amenities. Although they vary by category, every room has complimentary 24-hour room service, a full bathroom with Penhaligon's toiletries, a sitting area, a writing desk and Cunard stationery, a flat screen satellite TV, air conditioning, a pillow concierge menu, and a direct dial telephone. On board, take advantage of the public events offered by the ship. Enjoy a daily gaming hour with Cunard entertainers, help put together a public jigsaw puzzle, solve the New York Times daily puzzle, go on a scavenger hunt, solve in clues along the way, and listen to lectures from the onboard Times experts. In addition to the public events on board, when you book your cruise through Times Journeys, you'll have access to exclusive events and activities throughout your trip. Take part in private Q&A sessions with your onboard experts, attend exclusive onboard teas and cocktail receptions with your experts and Times Journeys puzzle fans, have nightly dinners with the Times experts in the Britannia restaurant, enjoy group collaborations on puzzles, and take part in a puzzle tournament with your Times experts. 
All of these events are offered only to Times Journey's guests and give you the opportunity to interact with and learn from your experts throughout your journey. So now I'm pleased to introduce your three onboard experts, Deb Amlin, Joe Fagliano, and Ben Zimmer. Each of them brings so much knowledge to the table and will be with you throughout your crossword journey to make solving fun and accessible and to give you unique insight into the world of puzzles. So first, let me introduce Deb Amlin. Deb is the columnist and editor of Wordplay, the crossword column for the New York Times. She has also been a senior columnist for David Pogue's Yahoo Tech and is the author of It's Not PMS, It's You. Her work can also be seen in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Establishment, and Bust Magazine, amongst others. Deb, thank you so much for joining us. I like Desiree. Now nice yeah, to talk about your experience and what you'll be doing on board. Oh, great. Well, I the first thing I want to say is that if you are going to sign up for a cruise and be on a boat for a week, you don't want to be with Business Day. We're much more fun than that. Uh, if you're going to be on a boat for a week, you want to party with the word people. So uh, I'm happy to see that people have signed up for the cruise and we're looking forward to helping you solve. So do you want to talk a little bit about how you started at the New York Times? I'm happy to. Uh, I came in through sort of a side door. Uh, I'm a humor writer by trade and um, there was uh, the Wordplay blog actually started in 2008. Uh, by a man named Jim Horn, and uh, at a certain point, uh, both writers who were involved, Jim Horn and Patrick Merrill, left the blog, and uh, Will Schwartz very kindly asked me if I wanted to take it over. I had had a book come out, and he figured I could write in whole sentences, so uh, I took over Wordplay, and um, the Times was very welcoming. Since then, uh, the column has expanded and picked up a lot of readers, uh, mainly because we are geared toward helping people who would really like to improve their crossword solving skills, and so we talk about tricky clues, we talk about how to find the theme in the puzzle, and I try to make Make it uh, as entertaining as the puzzle is. We, we use humor to sort of lower people's anxiety about the New York Times crossword puzzle, which can be a little intimidating. And uh, we, uh, you know, we're, we're very happy to have people. We have a very, very chatty group of commenters. Our, our community is very big and very strong. And um, the thing that I like the most is watching uh, the readers help each other through the solve. So how did you start doing crossword puzzles? Uh, I, very similar to a lot of people I've spoken to, I started by looking over my father's shoulder. My father was a New York Times crossword solver, and I really enjoyed watching him fill in the black and white squares. And I, I would watch him, and I thought he was the smartest man in the world for being able to do this. And I didn't really pick up on it until I was out of college, and I needed something to do in my spare time as I started working. And I fell in love with uh, the New York Magazine uh, crosswords, which were uh, very, very funny and uh, very entertaining. And then uh, I got into making crossword puzzles. I'm a constructor as well. And uh, I made my debut with a Sunday New York Times crossword in, I want to say, 2004. Four. And um, after getting a bunch of puzzles published, it became something that I really enjoyed doing. And I found, I sort of found my tribe, the word people. That's great. Uh, so you hold uh, live solves uh, usually on a, a pretty weekly basis yes. on Facebook. Um, so what inspired you to start doing those? Well, you know, there, there's a so the prevailing wisdom was that crossword puzzles are sort of a solitary activity, and I, I've really not never believed that. I think, that, and maybe it's just an, a, a facet of my own personality. I tend to be a very social person. Um, I think that crosswords can be a, a really fun group activity, which is one of the things I'm really looking forward to on the boat. Um, the first 
live solve through the New York Times was actually done by a reporter named Deborah Costa. And uh, we eventually worked together to make sure that um, somebody who could help other people uh, who were watching the live stream, you know, understand the clues and improve their own solving skills. And I took over for them. And now every Thursday at one o'clock on the New York Times Facebook page, we uh, solve the Thursday puzzle together. So during those live solves, or just in your wordplay column as well, what is the hardest clue you've had to explain or solve? Um, I don't know if it's a clue as much as the theme. The double rebuses tend to really make people fall out of their chairs, and that could be uh, a rebus is is a crossword element where uh, you can write more than one letter in a square. So you might have a word that fits in the square. And a double rebus is when it reads a certain way, one way across, and it reads a totally different way down. And that really flummoxes people. Yeah, that sounds pretty tricky. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So what are you most looking forward to during this cruise? What are you looking forward to, Jill? I'm looking forward to meeting some solvers. I think that'll be really cool. Absolutely. Yeah. I I like I always enjoy watching people have that aha moment mm-hmm. when they finally get the puzzle or they get the theme. I think that that's fun. Another thing I'm really looking forward to are the buffets because I'm a food <gasps> person. I like that. And there's a Godiva chocolate bar that I'm planning to spend a lot of time in. That's a good plan. Do you want to talk a little bit about what your role on board will be with the guests? Uh, my role will primarily be uh, sashaying up to the buffet and uh, eating as much as possible. And I'm also going to be hanging out and helping people who are stuck on a clue or who don't see the theme or who would really just like to talk about the puzzle. Uh, we talk about things like what the puzzle brings up for them. Some people think, you know, if the, if the theme covers a certain subject, it might remind them of a story. People love to tell their stories. And I love, as a writer, I love to listen to stories, other people's stories. So I think that's mainly what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be helping people solve and helping them enjoy the puzzles as much as possible. So do you want to talk a little bit about the difference between the U.S. crossword uh, versus the crossword in other countries and how people joining this cruise from other countries with different crossword experiences might, what are the main differences they might see? Well, I think think that uh, American style crosswords have different rules than crosswords from other countries. Uh, I know that we probably are going to have a lot of British people joining us and they're more used to what we would call cryptic crosswords, where the cluing system is very different. Uh, the letters are not necessarily all checked like they would be in a, an American style grid. And we can get, I'm sure Joel or Ben are going to get into that on board. Um, I I think that that's something that, that Joel could probably answer a little bit better, but it, What the rest of the world considers a crossword is what the British would probably consider a crossword. Those are the cryptics. Most most other countries solve like that, and the American-style crosswords tend to be unique. What do you think, Joel? Well, yes, as you said, uh, the British have a different type of crossword than we do. Um, It's harder. So there's one benefit to the American-style crosswords is they're easier to complete. Um, But what's interesting about the British style crosswords is that each clue is its own puzzle. Each clue has its own um, bit of wordplay that you have to crack, which makes them very satisfying to solve. You get almost 30 to 40 different little mini puzzles to crack within the larger puzzle. And that's why they're popular around the world. Very cool. Okay. So this cruise is celebrating the 75th anniversary uh, for the crossword puzzle. So what are the, some of the things the crossword team has done to celebrate this milestone? I could start with that. Uh, Will and I have been editing a series of puzzles for the 75th anniversary year that are co-made by celebrities. Um, 
calling it like the celebrity 75th anniversary celebration. Um, some notable celebrities, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson made a puzzle with space puns. That was very fun. We recently ran a puzzle by former President Bill Clinton, who himself is an avid crossword solver. It should be said that the, the celebrities that we reached out to to participate with are all people who have expressed that they are daily New York Times crossword solvers, okay. which is kind of a, a cool way to get them involved with the passion that they love. Um, going forward, we're, we've got about uh, four or five um, on file, some from John Lithgow and others. So there's more to be seen down that road. We ran one this week uh, by the singer Lisa Loeb. Oh, cool. Okay. We'll have to keep our eyes out for these, the upcoming <laughs> yeah. ones, too. Um, and you also ran a huge spread in the paper around the 75th anniversary. Yes. Um, did you get any feedback about that? Oh, a lot. Yeah? Yeah, people really enjoyed it. You know, we had um, a sort of a modular thing that – we did. We uh, we had a timeline of all of the historical events that have happened to the New York Times crossword since it started in 1942. Um, we I think Will picked out 11 crosswords that would be good for beginners. Uh, you you made some many crosswords, right, Joel? Did I made some things for that issue? One cool feature of this it was called the Puzzle Mania section, and it was a special print fold-in you can find right behind your A section. And we had the biggest crossword the Times has ever run. It covered a whole center spread when you opened up the paper. It was 50 squares by 50 squares. It contained a hidden contest. Um, and people had a lot of fun. I saw got screenshots of people showing me themselves <laughs> solving with their whole families on the wall That's and great. lots of things like that. Oh, yeah. We had, we had people tweeting to us their uh their solves and you know completed puzzles it was great people really really enjoyed that that's great that must have been really fun to see after all that hard work put into that <laughs> yeah i bet people really loved that cool well th thanks so much deb all right so now let me introduce joel fagliano Joel has been a digital pu puzzle editor for the New York Times since Mar March 2016, and before that, he was an assistant to Will Shorts. Joel received a BA in Linguistics and Cognitive Science from Pomona College in California. Joel, thanks for being with us here today. It's good to be here, Desiree. Well, um, so do you want to just talk a little bit quickly about your background and your role on board? Sure. So I'm on board uh, to provide a little bit of insight into the uh, times crossword editing and puzzle creation. So I'm a puzzle maker myself. I make the daily mini crossword for the Times app. It now also appears on uh, in the A section on A3. Snapchat. Um, and on Snapchat, as Deb points out. Um, and I also help Will Shorts edit the crossword that appears in the Times every day still. So some things I'll be bringing on board is expertise in the editing of the crossword. I'll give a inside look into how we take a puzzle and shape it up to be ready to run in the New York Times, as well as how you might build your own mini crossword, um, how to take a blank grid, start filling in the letters so that everything crosses. It's very tough, but I'm excited to share it with uh, the people on, on board the cruise. Great. So, how did you start at the New York Times, and what was, has your experience been like? So I actually started in my freshman year of college. I interned uh, that summer with Will Shorts. It's kind of a funny story because I didn't have a job going into that summer, and I was panicking, and I sent <laughs> Will Shorts an email and asked, do you have an intern? And miraculously, that worked, um, and that was my start at the New York Times, I then subsequently worked for him the following summers until I graduated and was brought on board as his assistant. Um, that was in 2014. Also in 2014, we launched the New York Times Crossword app. And when we launched that, I started making content for that app. And that's how I became in charge of making the mini crossword. Great. So what does a typical day look like for you? I'm sure it changes a lot. <laughs> it does change a lot, but a typical day is actually, 
I go to Will Schwartz's house. He works from home in Pleasantville, New York. So I reverse commute out <laughs> to the suburbs, which is fun. Um, and Will and I do kind of three main tasks. Um, one is we receive about 75 to 100 crosswords a week. Um, the crosswords that run in the paper are all made by people from around the country. I was one of those people. Uh, I had a crossword, my first crossword in the Times run when I was in high school. Um, and so Will and I look over the submissions that get sent in and we make our judgments about uh, which ones we think should run. And then I write everybody back who sent puzzles in. That's one thing I do on a nearly daily basis. And another is to edit and typeset and fact check the puzzle that's about to appear in the coming weeks in the paper. Okay. So how did the idea for a mini puzzle come to be? Was it something that was already planned when you got here or is it, was it new? Uh, when I got here, the, the idea actually comes from our old product head, Matt Hurel, who uh, basically had the idea that the New York Times crossword app should have like a freemium model, if you know, <laughs> uh, like yeah. because the Times crossword costs money, uh, has a subscription, uh, he, he wanted people to still come to the app and be able to have a little fun with crosswords and not just go away yeah. with no puzzle to do. So he pitched to various people what could a small premium type uh, crossword look like, and we settled on this five by five idea. Um, so that was the start of it, although to be honest, at the beginning it was more speculative about whether this would even be a feature that would continue, <laughs> as I, when I look back at the first ones I can see I'm sort of messing around and I'm trying things. Um, but soon it really caught on and had a following, people sort of become a uh, hit. Do you notice at all that people who start out by solving the mini puzzles then start going on to start doing the big puzzles and get a little more confident? You know, actually I do, and I didn't think that that would be the case. I thought if uh, people just like doing these mini, maybe they are only going to have a minute out of their day, so that's why they'll do it. But I found that, uh, Deb was mentioning this earlier, there's sort of a fear factor around the New York Times crossword. It's so tough. How am I ever going to do it? And the mini, while I clue it in an easy way, I think it still has a lot of the sophistication and a lot of the same marks as the regular New York Times crossword. And so people start to realize, you know what, I can actually do these things. Uh, they get that same feeling of satisfaction that they get from the normal crossword. And so after doing the minis, they'll, they feel like I'm ready to summit. I'm ready to try a Monday crossword. And it's actually not as hard as they thought it would be. And then a Tuesday and a Wednesday and, and on and on. It's a great confidence booster. Yeah, I bet. Plus, people don't have to spend as much time on it. Mm -hmm. People might not be willing to spend hours on a daily puzzle, but you can do a five by five in a couple of minutes and still feel that same satisfaction. Yeah, that's probably a good gateway into oh, the, the gateway main drug. one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Get those people solving. Um, so, what advice would you have for someone just starting to try crossword puzzles? I would say my advice would be to solve with a friend. I think this is actually um, something not enough people do. Crosswords, as Deb was saying, are often solitary activity, but if you're just getting into crosswords, it can be really fun to work with, uh, work with somebody. You put in an answer, they put in an answer. It's a good way to share knowledge. Oh, did you know this? Oh, wait, I'm not going to tell you this, but I'll give you a hint. It's a, it's a fun way to interact with the crossword. Also, yeah, I, th yeah. I think, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, and I just wrote about this for an upcoming column. Um, a lot of people who are starting to solve don't realize that there's a trickiness curve that goes on during the week. The Mondays tend to, some people say they're the easiest. I would rather say that they're the most straightforward in terms of cluing and vocabulary, whereas it gets harder or trickier during the week and with Saturday being the hardest puzzle of the week. Um, if you're just starting out, a lot of people tend to want to start on a weekend because they're off, they have time, downtime stuff, and, and God help you if you pick up a Saturday <laughs> for the first time and, and think that you're going to be able to solve it. It's, there's, 
you have to learn what the clues are asking you to do, and that's not something you learn right away. So I always suggest that people start with either the minis or the Monday puzzles, which we're which are deliberately clued to be uh, more straightforward with a little bit less wordplay, but they're accessible to beginners. Yeah. Okay. What set the Times Crossword apart from other puzzles? Yeah, so I actually think it's, uh, Deb was discussing earlier, we have we have the themes to our puzzle, so I'll, I'll get into that just a little bit on this call. Basically, the theme of a crossword is what unifies the longest answers. Um, it was interesting, the other day I was looking this up, the very first Times crossword, the theme, this was in 1952, the theme was uh, the New York City watershed, and it was all terms about the the various sewers and the various dams. It was very which, boring. Which at that point might have been interesting. Maybe we don't that know. Was fascinating we weren't there. The so a, a crossword theme doesn't have to be inherently interesting. It can be boring and it can be dry. And so what I think sets the Times crossword apart from others is that our themes are um, they're innovative, they're interesting, and every day they have a, just a bit of wordplay to them that makes you go, oh, I never thought of that phrase could be interpreted in a different way, or, oh, that's actually a pretty funny pun. Um, every day we're just trying to kind of, kind of like a circus, just a different way of poking at language, a different way of um, entertaining the solver. This is something that a lot of people don't know. That Will and Joel have an open submission process, so anyone can submit a crossword to the New York Times. I think one thing that really sets them apart is that the puzzles who are so, that are selected are made by very creative people, and they tend to have, um, they tend to go for the most daring ideas. We've got crossword puzzles that have visual elements to them that you would never expect. Uh, the wordplay is, is terrific and consistent. So um, I would say that what sets them apart is that they're fun. It's a good way to be set apart. Um, all right, thanks so much. Uh, so we also have with us Ben Zimmer. Ben is a linguist, lexicographer, and a language, language columnist for the Wall Street Journal and former columnist for the Boston Globe and the New York Times Magazine. He is the recipient of the Linguistic Society of America's first ever Linguistic Journalism Award and was recently awarded the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism from Yale University. Ben, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. This is a real treat. Uh, so do you want to just give us a little bit on your background and also your role on board the cruise? Sure. Well, um, yeah, I describe myself as an all-around word nut because, you know, ever since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by words. I was a dictionary hound, you know, from the age of 10 or 11, fascinated by word games, word puzzles, wordplay of all kind. Um, actually, when I was a kid, I joined the National Puzzlers League um, and got to know Will Shorts and the other sort of leading figures of the puzzling world uh, way back when. This is in the 1980s. So this was before Will was uh, New York Times crossword editor. He was at Games Magazine as the editor there. Um, so this has been an abiding passion for me, and I've sort of stayed a, a friend of the puzzling and the crossword world all through that time. Uh, so it's, I guess it's not surprising that I got into linguistics and lexicography, the sort of the study of words and the study of language more generally. And my passion now is really um, speaking about linguistic issues to a general audience um, in a non-technical uh, way, just sort of breaking down how words enter the language, um, how new innovations are formed linguistically, things like that with, without any of the, uh, the technical jargon that you sometimes get in linguistics. And so I get to do that in my language column, which I now uh, write for the Wall Street Journal. I've been writing it for the last few years, before that the Boston Globe and before that uh, New York Times Magazine. After uh, William Sapphire passed away, um, I, I uh, took over the on language uh, column for a year or two. And um, so, you know, through, through this kind of language commentary, I get to keep track of 
uh, interesting new words coming into the language, or very often revivals of older words. You know, sometimes there'll be a word in the news and people will think, well, where did that come from? And in fact, it will have a long and interesting kind of cultural history. So I like to track that kind of history. Um, and there are all sorts of great new tools at our disposal for figuring out how sort of words uh, come into the language and mutate and change meaning and all that fun stuff. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm very much a word nut and feel like, you know, this kind of, uh, uh, crossword uh, cruise that we're all going to be on is definitely my kind of people, people who love language and love words. Great. Uh, so this question kind of speaks to what you were just uh, talking about a little bit. Uh, how have you seen language evolving through your career? Well, I came of age in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, so, uh, but really, you know, the big changes have happened in the 21st century. So 21st century English has been marked by these new forms of digital communication or electronically mediated communication. And um, all of that has had a kind of a transformational effect on the way that we communicate although in some ways uh, not so radical, not so huge uh, a change. I think uh, every time there's a new kind of technology, um, there's a lot of hand wringing about how that technology is going to affect language and society, basically. Um, uh, so this was true when the, you know, when the, when the, uh, when the telegraph came into use and the, and the telephone and so forth. These are new communication technologies um, always seem to be speeding things up and um, possibly changing language for the worse. And so a lot of people raise those concerns. Is that what's happening now with the advent of the internet, social media, smartphones, and all the rest? And we do see a lot of changes for sure. And interesting new forms of language uh, being created very much on the fly to match the new technology that we use. But Essentially, though, you know, the English language uh, is uh, changing much more slowly than we might think of, even though, you know, again, there are all these sort of rapid technological changes. Um, and so the way that we interact face to face when we speak to each other um, may not be all that different than it was a few decades ago. Of course, when we go online or when we're texting and so forth, there could be all sorts of different ways that we interact with each other. And those are really fascinating to study and to track. Very interesting. Um, so what are some of the standout changes in language you've seen as a result of this technological trends, social media, and phone usage nowadays? Well, one thing that's fascinating is, you know, people have always been innovative with language, coining new words or phrases. Uh, but these days, those changes can can uh, circulate much more quickly than they used to. Um, if someone came up with a clever new word or phrase, they might share it with you know their immediate group of friends, and it might spread out from there or it might not. But of course, these days, if you're on social media, um, that can all happen very very quickly. And so somebody can you know come up with some uh, clever new thing in the language, and you know within days or even hours, it can become something that people are spreading around. And, um, and it's interesting to sort of watch these things develop on um, Twitter and other social media. Very often, the way these things might spread is through the hashtag. Um, and so, you know, that uh, hashtag on Twitter with, you know, the hash sign plus a, a word or a bunch of words smashed together um, was originally just thought of as something that would facilitate conversation by organizing it on certain topics, but people very quickly started repurposing the hashtag uh, to be used for something else and very often to spread jokes, spread political commentary or criticism, um, you know, very sort of messages and slogans and things like that, which um, spread very quickly. And certainly in our last presidential election, we saw that happen in various ways, not just with hashtags, but with all sorts of ways that language sometimes uh, would get repurposed and spread around in interesting ways, um, sometimes for political purposes to, you know, advocate for a particular candidate. So all those things are happening much more quickly. And what, another thing that we're also seeing beyond just um, the sort of the text form of language is the way that text combines with images. 
whether that is uh, those little images known as emoji um, or uh, gifs, animated gifs, those you know those those uh, short um, animated uh, you know graphics that you might see accompanying a particular message. So people are learning to combine different linguistic and communicative resources to shape a message in a way that's really fascinating to see. They're sort of creating whole new genres of communication just by taking what's at their disposal. Yeah, those are really interesting points. Um, so what would you say are some of the most interesting differences between US English and British English? Uh, that's a great question, and it's one I'm thinking about, especially because we're going on this transatlantic crossing, and I think we'll have a transatlantic audience, both uh, American and British people on board. Um, and so one of my talks is going to be devoted to the differences between American and British English. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, something that is interesting because uh, the, you know, American English and British English are really just dialects of English, they're mutually intelligible for the most part. Um, but, uh, you know, as George Bernard Shaw famously, famously said, it's like we're two people separated by a common language. And so what separates us very often seems much more important, you know, the, the what are actually rather tiny differences of vocabulary, pronunciation, and to some extent grammar as well, um, sometimes get amplified because they really set us apart in this particular way. Um, and uh, I think that uh, British people are much more aware of these differences than American people are, generally because uh, British people, in, a, in addition to speaking their own particular dialect, may encounter a lot of American English through uh, popular media, movies, songs, uh, and uh, television, and so forth. Um, and so they're, they're keenly aware of these distinctions between you know American English and British English and there's very often in the British press there are complaints about the Americanization of British English that there are various influences coming from across the Atlantic which people would rather not see um, but what's fascinating to, to look at if you sort of look at these differences more closely is that very often the complaints um, you know sometimes it has to do again with just sort of the latest uh, the latest vocabulary coming out of youth culture and that sort of thing. But a lot of the sort of the basic differences go back centuries um, to the common roots of British and American English. Obviously, American, uh, you know, settlers in the American colonies brought over their particular dialects from, uh, from England. And uh, a lot of the things that we now think of as differences really go back to that era of early modern English so that um, you know, there are certain things that are th thought of as American, which actually existed back in sort of Shakespearean English. It just so happened they fell out of British English, but they survived in American English. Meanwhile, various other things survived in British English and fell out of use in American English. So they've gone off in these two different trajectories. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting to sort of get down into the nitty gritty of well, really what are those differences? Um, you know, people, ha again, have general stereotypes. Americans have stereotypes of the way that British people speak and write and vice versa. British people feel that way about Americans. But I think we can bridge that gap that, uh, you know, that gap that separates the two. And and I'm hoping yeah, in one of uh, one of the talks I'll be giving as part of the uh, transatlantic crossing to explore that in more depth. I'm sure there'll be some really interesting conversations on board about that. Um, so what are you most looking forward to during the cruise? Well, um, I just am looking forward to being among fellow word lovers. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I go way back uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sort of loving words and loving language. And so I'm looking forward to that. And, you know, I've I've been, you know, um, uh, at least on the outskirts of the Crossroad community for quite a while. Um, my son and I, my son who's about 10, uh, we we like to go to the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament in Stamford, Connecticut, which Will Shorts hosts. Um, for us, that's like our Super Bowl, and you know, it, we're we're not we're not competing, but we're spectating. And the 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 people in the community are just the best, and and so um, you know I, I you know crossword solvers and constructors are just such a great community. 
Um, you know, if you've seen the documentary Wordplay, you get that sense of community and that, you know, how it feels like, you know, uh, a family and you're, you're sort of uh, meeting with, with people who you, you grow to really uh, be close to. So, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of this uh, crossword cruise as an extension of that and, you know, really looking forward to interacting with the people on board. That's great. Uh, from a linguist perspective, it, are there any quick tips you would give to a beginner solver to make crosswords more approachable? Uh, that's an interesting question. And, you know, I mentioned my son is, you know, 10, about the age I was when I got into crosswords. And so I'm helping him with tips on, uh, you know, how to approach uh, solving crosswords. And one thing that is key um, is that, you know, if you think about the crossword clue as a phrase, its linguistic structure is, uh, you know, it has to mirror the answer. So a noun has to be clued with a noun phrase, a verb with a verb phrase, that sort of thing. They serve the same grammatical function. Um, and so that's like one thing that's always important to keep in mind, um, that kind of grammatical matching between the clue and the answer, not only the part of speech, but also how that part of speech is inflected. So a plural noun has to be clued in a plural way and a past tense verb has to be clued in a past tense way. So those little things uh, can can help certainly beginner, beginner solvers recognize um, that, you know, if they see a clue oh, and they see, oh, this must be a plural noun, I'll put an S at the end. At least I know it will probably end in an S because most plural nouns end in S's. Um, you know, that, that can be a first step to sort of appreciating you know, how clues are constructed and how you're supposed to figure them out. Oh, cool, that's a really interesting tip. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you, uh, each of you for, you each bring such interesting different backgrounds and you're gonna bring so much knowledge to this trip and I'm sure solving on board with all of you is gonna be a really amazing experience, everybody on board. Um, so now let's just quickly go through some FAQs. So first off is airfare included. So our prices do not include airfare since we found that guests often like to use their air miles to purchase their flights and this gives them flexibility to do that. We are happy to assist you in booking your travel to New York City or your international flight from London. What documentation do you need to travel? So you'll need to have a valid passport and the tour operator will assist you with any necessary visas or travel documents that you might need. Um, are there planned activities and lectures on board? Yes, in addition to the many exclusive events and activities planned for Times Journeys travelers, you'll also have the access to the entertainment and activities provided to the public on board. And lastly, what should you pack? Uh, so before your departure, you'll be provided with a detailed packing list for your trip to make sure you have everything that you need. So now I'll open this up for your questions. Uh, you'll see in the panel on the right-hand side of your screen uh, a space where you'll be able to, to uh, type those in. Okay, great. So I have one asking... Um, why are Times Journeys prices higher than Cunard's? So one thing to note with our prices is that Times Journeys prices include all of the exclusive events and activities you get when you book through us. Uh, this includes puzzle tournaments, group, co group collaborations on puzzles with your tour experts, nightly dinners with experts, the pre-cruise brunch, and many more exclusive events. Okay. Someone asked, I'm completely new to crosswords. Is this still a good trip for me? Oh, you yeah. guys like oh, to take yeah. that one? <laughs> Absolutely. I make as many mistakes as anybody else. So um, absolutely, even if you've never seen a crossword before in your life or you've never attempted to solve one, come with us. And by the time we dock at Southampton, you'll be solving. Great. Okay, we have a question. Uh, is there a single supplement? So yes, there are single supplements and they do vary by cabin. So if you uh, like more information, you can contact us to find out additional details. Is there, 
is there internet on board the trip, the cruise during the trip? So internet packages are available for purchase on board. Um, please note that we cannot guarantee the quality or availability of internet service on board uh, due to the nature of satellite connection, but you can definitely purchase that. And one more, we'll take one more question. Uh, so how does the time change work on an eastbound transatlantic crossing? So the ship's clock will move forward one hour at 12 p.m. on five out of seven days of the voyage in order to account for the time difference between New York and the UK. And you'll be notified whenever there's a time change. So now I'll just give you a quick recap of the cruise. So we only have one departure and it's on December 7th, 2017. This is a nine day cruise and the price starts at $2,895, which as I've mentioned, includes all the Times Journey's exclusive events and activities that I've spoken about. Um, so just as a reminder, exclusive events such as the brunch with Will Shorts at the New York Times building, puzzle tournaments, Q&A sessions, cocktail receptions, and dinners with your experts, um, as well as the group collaborations, uh, those are only available to passengers who book through Times Journeys. Um, and as I've said, you'll still have access to all the public events being offered on board. Um, but booking through us gives you these added activities that allow you to interact with your Times experts and fellow Times puzzle fans in a really special way. So we have a number of different cabin categories um, that are listed here, uh, starting, as I've said, from $2,895 with a single supplement of $1,125 and ranging up to $7,055 with a single supplement of $5,740. Um, so if you'd like to book, please call our call center at 855-698-7979, or you can visit um, nytimes.com slash crossword cruise to find out more about this itinerary. Uh, so with that, a big thank you to Deb, Joel, and Ben for joining us today. We really appreciate you sharing with us and giving us a look at just why this cruise is going to be such a special and fun experience. Um, and thank you to all of our listeners, and we hope to see you on board. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.